Uh, my name is Arthur Flug. I'm the executive director of the Cup for Birth Holocaust Center. And I want to welcome you here today. Uh, for those of you who keep diaries and those of you who keep in memory today's events, uh, today is part of the history of the Cup for Birth Holocaust Center because what we decided to do is begin lecture programs with prominent speakers <clears throat> and prominent panelists having to do with issues that run concurrent or come within the Holocaust. And today we're doing such a program, and uh, what I'd like to do to start off that program is introduce the assistant director of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center, whose idea was to put this program together and co coordinate it, Ayala Tambir. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, thank you for that um, lovely introduction. I would first like to thank our guest speaker and our panelists for being here and uh, to uh, share their expertise on such an important topic. Uh, with us, we have uh, Commissioner of New York State Division of Human Rights, Galen Kirkland, uh, Dr. Emily Tai, Professor of History here at the college, and Dr. Saria Danielson, uh, Professor of History here at the college. Uh, we will open with a lecture with our guest speaker, Dr. Cynthia Kamikaze, uh, and we will then follow with a panel discussion and a Q&A uh, from you, the audience. Uh, and now let me introduce you to Cynthia Kamikaze. Uh, currently, she is serving as multilateral officer at the permanent mission off Rwanda to the UN office in Geneva. Dr. Kamikaze acts as a human rights and humanitarian affairs officer to support negotiations, particularly those related to human rights around the world. Among her many achievements, Dr. Kamikaze advised the permanent representative and ambassador for Rwanda, as well as other member states, on issues related to genocide, genocide denial, and its violation of human rights. She was a UN Human Rights Accountability Project coordinator and human rights advisor at the, nation, at the National Human Rights Commission. Dr. Kamikaze holds a PhD in international relations with specialization in international law from the Geneva School of Diplomacy and Berkeley University. She will talk about the Rwanda genocide. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, I thank you all for granting me the honor to stand before this distinguished assembly to share with you all some thoughts experiences and observations on the genocide committed against the Tutsi in Rwanda and the current trends of it. I'm indeed honored. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, there is an old Rwandan saying that says, at the end of the day, after all his good works in Rwanda and elsewhere, God comes home to Rwanda to sleep as it is the most beautiful place in the world. And this is the truth. This land of a thousand hills and valley is for me the most beautiful place on earth, and yet at some point in time, it became the blood-drenched land of million atrocities. December of last year, around the world, we commemorated the 60th anniversary of Convention on Prevention and Punishment of Crime of Genocide. A few months after, in April of 2009, for Rwandan people and all their friends, we marked the 15th anniversary of genocide committed against the Tutsi in Rwanda. On both occasions, we remember not only all those victims who needlessly lost their lives, or the gallant men and women who fought and lost their lives, and, on, and the victims who, sorry, lost their lives so that we, all of us here, may live on. But we also gathered here today in praise of those who stood firm in their resolve in pursuit of civil sanity and justice and who live to tell the world what they saw. There is a short Nigerian proverb of the Yoruba people which states that, if you go to a place that no one has ever been before, you will see what no man has ever seen before. And in the Rwandan of 1994, those who have lived the victorious the vanquished, and even the visitor, have all been to that place that no one has ever been to before, and have 
all seen what no man has ever seen before. The place of which I speak in term and space is none other than the genocide of 1994, the genocide committed against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Genocide is that place that exists at the final limit of destructive human experience. And with this experience shared and the lesson learned, this event, this present time, marks a turning point not only in the history of Rwanda, but also in the history of all mankind. This is therefore, it is therefore we, all of us here, alongside all those who have been to that place, <coughs> who are now duty bound for the sake of our children and our children's children, duty bound to keep alive an unmodified factual account of the event of genocide committed against the Tutsi without so much of a bit of revision or negation. Today, ladies and gentlemen, it is a resounding trumpet call for all those who have seen or heard of that place, the place of, at the limit of human experience, to speak out, to speak always, and most of all, to speak truthfully. The, his, the story of genocide is as old as the history of organized power, if not as old as, old as time itself. But of the 20th century, it begins in Africa, in the arid desert sands of Omahake, what we call now the Kalahari of Namibia. And it ends in Africa amidst the lush green hills of Rwanda. And as, uh, as if that was not enough, of the 21st century, it begins in Africa yet again, in another desert, in time, this time in the arid desert sand of Darfur in Sudan. Genocide as defined by the United Nations 1948, is a, is a crime against human rights, is a crime against humanity, and is taken to mean act committed with intent to destroy in a whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious groups. These acts include killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of this group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction, imposing measures intended to prevent birth within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Indeed, genocide is one of the deepest problems for human thoughts. The management of genocide should therefore call for the very best effort of human reflection and human endeavor, in so doing, no story must go untold. No one, not one person, visitor, vanquished or visitor, victor, vanquished or visitor, who has been to that place, the place on the very fringe of humanity, no one of them should ever remain silent about the truth. A French critic, journalist, and novelist, Jean Baptiste Alphonse Carr, described well the irony of life when he said, Plus ce change, Plus la même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. What has not changed through the ages are the eight stages of genocide. These stages were articulated by Gregory Stanton in his address to the US State Department in 1996. He rationalized that genocide was a process that developed in eight overlapping stages, which he named classification, symbolization, dehumanization, organization, polarization, preparation, extermination, and denial. Each of these stages is predictable, progressive, and stoppable. The later stages must be preceded by the earlier stages. Though earlier stages continue to operate throughout the process such that, by the end, a demonic dramatic mixture of all simultaneous stages unfolds in unison. In addition to these stages today, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Ian Paul Oluch, preliminary stage of genocide, which he called the pretext. In the pretext stage, man, in his spiritual, greedy, simplistic state of mind, goes about his usual daily businesses, encountering both pleasures and prejudices with ease and familiarity. Many of the utterances heard and prejudices felt during the fever pitch of genocide are the same words uttered and prejudices 
expressed during common civil disharmony. It is during this preliminary phase that, that negative emotions of population are fomented, harnessed, and then galvanized. Let me attempt to give you a common pretext. If those people go away, back to where they came from, then our problems will be solved and we live in a peace and harmony as brothers and sisters. In our land where the rivers will turn to milk and the rain into honey, and where all the streets would soon be paved with gold. How often have all of us, inside and outside Rwanda, heard these very same utterances in our own spheres of life? In the case of Rwanda, it was for the Tutsi to return to Chad, Egypt, Ethiopia, or even biblical Mesopotamia, or whatever it was that the Hutu were made to believe the Tutsi had come from. The atmosphere in Rwanda was widespread with embellished rumors of past atrocities supposedly committed by the Tutsi and the past subservient raw and subhuman status that the Hutu were supposedly forced to endure against their will and would endure again if the Tutsi were to ever return to political power. The first of Gregory Stanton eight stages of genocide is classification. Classification is the genocidal classification is the classification of people into us and them by ethnicity, race, religion, or nationality. <coughs> In this case, it was to be classification by ethnicity into Hutu, Tutsi, and Kwa. Such classification and identification was formally introduced during the Belgian colonial era and integrated into the structure of national identity documents issued to all citizens of Rwanda starting from 1962. I remember as a young girl of five being asked by my teacher what ethnic group I belonged to and I responding with pride by the only answer I knew, I'm Rwandan. Then I got the beating of my life and I was told to leave the classroom and come back only when I knew what I was. This system forced all persons to be affiliated with one or other of the government-defined groups. It goes without saying that during the time of crisis, this form of classification and identification greatly facilitated the targeting of persons on the basis of the group affiliation, making all Tutsis readily identifiable for marginalization, oppression, and subsequent extermination. In the next stage, the stage of symbolization, the characteristics of target group were defined. Targeted Rwanda nationals were preferentially referred to as being Tutsi as, to, as opposed to be called Rwandan and were distinguished by their physical appearances. A typical Tutsi was described and identified as being tall, thin, with a long neck and a long nose. Anyone who fitted this description was a potential target, Tutsi or non-Tutsi. Classification and symbolization are universally human and do not necessarily result in progression towards genocide unless they lead to the next stage of dehumanization. Dehumanization is a stage during which one group denies the humanity of the other. Members of the victim group are typically equated with animals, vermin, insects, or diseases. Stanton hypothesized that dehumanization helped perpetrators to overcome the normal human disgust against murder. In Rwanda, it was the order of the day for the Tutsi to be referred to as cockroaches. In Yenzi, in our native language, Kinyarwanda. At this stage, hate propaganda in print and on hate radios such as Hajemir Kolin, was used to vilify the Tutsi and fire up the predominantly Hutu masses into an emotionally energized mob, a mob that would soon need leadership and organization to harness and channel its persisting energy and bring us to the next phase of our deliberation, that of organization. The organization stage of genocide in Rwanda, as it has been in genocide all through history, was achieved with the support of the state. In Rwanda, the, sa the state machinery used militia to provide operational genocidal functions, thereby facilitating the option of future deniability of state involvement. 
Through the year preceding 1994, special army units and militia were trained and armed, the most notorious of which were the Inhera Hamne or Imhuza Migambi. Sometimes organization was inform informal or decentralized in the form of inspired neighborhood watch, or group, neighborhood watch groups and institutional gangs. Plans were made for the genocidal killing, some of which necessitated the purchase of stockpiling of all manners of weapons. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not a secret that the arms, the arms trade is a multi-billion dollar inherently dirty global trade. With this in mind, the Rwandan government at the time had no difficulty selling to the world the idea that they were not the aggressors, that in fact they were the ones under attack and needed to defend the country against a terrorist Tutsi group within its borders whose Uganda-based counterparts were soon to invade the sovereign space of the Republic of, of Rwanda. Given the state of affairs at the time, this was indeed a plausible and perhaps justifiable reason for anyone with either a limited or biased knowledge of the country to comply. Numerous countries near and far, likely and, un likely and <coughs> unlikely, is it to name but not diplomatic to name, along with numerous companies, listened to the call and complied. The stage was now set for all to proclaim the, to proclaim the royalty or elves. This was the tone that characterized the stage of polarization. Polarization by way of Hutu extremist doctrines and practices drove Rwanda's society apart, polarizing the society and all men of color therein into Hutu and Tutsi and nothing else. The primary enemy, the Tutsi, was defined and described, and any other person or groups of persons known or thought to be sympathetic to or remotely resembling to the Tutsi was upgraded to the status of potential enemy. If you were African American living in Rwanda at that time, now was a good time to leave. And quickly. Hate groups intensified the broadcasts of polarizing propaganda over the radio and the public gatherings in schools, colleges, and churches. Intermarriage or social interaction was taboo. Extremists targeted and terrorized moderate Hutus, intimidating and silencing them, giving them a clear choice. You are either with us or against us. Moderate from within the perpetrator's own group were numerous and influential and therefore the most likely and the most able to stop the evolution of genocide. The elimination of influential moderate Hutus were therefore a strategic security priority and indeed they were to become amongst the first to be arrested, tortured, and executed. Then came the preparations. The preparation took place nationwide, and the fabric of society was rearranged to become more vulnerable to assault. In Rwanda, terror and chaos was the modest operandi of this preparatory phase. Death lists were drawn up and disseminated throughout the country as open secrets. All Tutsi families, mine included, were aware of being on the list, but none of us truly believed that this will actually take place with the UN in the country. Sporadic rape, killings, and extra expropriation of property were used to drive a clear message home. Terrified nationals fled into the unprotected confines of their, fled the unprotected confines of their home, their rural and and urban society spontaneously segregated and concentrated into open fields, schools, churches, hotels, and stadia. This became the de facto concentration camps. Within these confines, victims were identified and separated out on the basis of the ethnic identity, perceived identity or complicity with the Tutsi, and were dealt with. The extermination, which by, way, by the way was already in process, escalated in the night of the 9th of April, 1994, and quickly became the mass killing legally called genocide. The spark that ignited the genocidal inferno was the sudden death of a former president, Habjarimana, in a, place, in a plane crash on the same night. 
It remained extermination to the killers because in their frantic state, they did not regard the, victim, the victims to be fully human, preferring to refer to the Tutsi as cockroaches, Nyenzi. These killings were generally referred to as work or clearing the bush. At the time, it was common to hear on the radio sentences such as, Top Tutsis in X neighborhood were killed today. We have done good work. Or in a Y neighborhood, there is still work to be done as we haven't found the dead bodies of major cockroaches. Because it was sponsored by the state, the armed forces often worked hand in hand with militia to do the killings. The pretext that was referred to before is applicable and very and very relevant at this stage as well. For instance, they will use it in the following manner. If these people disappear now, our problems will be over and we will live in a land of happiness with the rivers and mi of milk, rain of honey, hills of chocolate, and all the stones will be diamond. Ha! If they just go, they will go away and breed like crocodiles. And they will use magic to multiply some more. Then one day, they will come back again in swarms, and so will their children, and even their children's children, and we will all be finished. But if they die now, here and today, then these riches will be yours forever. We don't have much time left. If you do nothing now, they will eat us later. And behold, you non-believers, there is the avenging Tutsi army we have been telling you about all along. They have already killed the president. And you are next. What then transpired in Rwanda is best described and can only be described by those who were at that place, the abyss on the very fringe of humanity. Though I cannot bring myself to return to you the countless stories that I know and or I have heard, I would instead share with you the memory of a title of an article in Time magazine that was published at the heights of genocide and it read, there are no more devils left in hell. They are all in Rwanda. History was made in Rwanda. Unlike any other atrocities before it, the genocide against the Tutsi came to us all in real time through the mass media. Photographers and journalists transmitted live telecasts of men, women, children being intercepted, bludgeoned, and hacked to death. They beamed into our homes and into our lives the screens of the fleeing, the trapped, the raped, the wounded, and the dying. They beamed into our homes and into our lives the silence of the dead. We all witnessed the movement, the impunity, and the savagery of a dying nation gone mad. Then there were no pretora of newspapers. Then there were the pretora of newspapers and magazines, the radio, the telephones, and the internet. There were also tales of horror from countless survivors. And needless to say, there was the, mount, the mounting body count that washed, up, that washed up on the northern shores of Lake Victoria. Distinguished, ladies and gen, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, in our age of information, it is safe for us to say today that indeed the whole world was at that place, that deep, dark abyss on the very fringe of humanity in Rwanda and we all still at that place. The world and its human organs stood by and waited with food, shelter, and medicine in hand for the traditionally anticipated flood of Rwandan refugees to flee across the borders into neighboring countries. And when this did not happen, the assumption in various national offices was that there was no genocide but an exaggerated media account of a low grade civil war. What was poorly understood was that, because of the integral involvement of the population, the most vulnerable Rwandans, the Tutsis, were clustered together, awaiting salvation deep inside Rwanda. Those who dared to attempt the journey to the border had to contend with the genocidal population. Few ever made it to safety. Foreign embassies and high commissions evacuated the, nation, the nationals to safety and closed the missions, most leaving the loyal local staff behind to die. 10 Belgian soldiers needlessly lost their lives. The UN then withdrew their soldiers. Most of its effective deterrent military forces and its commanding officer who refused, 
who was, who was amongst those who refused to leave the Tutsis behind in later years lost his mind. Troops from DRC, formerly known as Zaire, joined forces with the former Rwandan government but found themselves engaged in a conflict of which they, did, they had little understanding. They witnessed what no Congolese soldier should ever have witnessed and withdrew from the horrors of Rwanda. Time was at essence. Mandatory decisive military actions by the Rwandan Patriotic Front, RPF, led to the rapid cessation of extermination phase and the total liberation of Rwanda. Professor Mahmoud Mamdani records the words of a soldier in his book entitled, When Victims Become Killers, which reads, when we captured Kigali, we thought we would face criminals in a state. Instead, we faced a criminal population. Underlying his statements, his statement was the real, real, realization that, though ordered by a minority of state functionaries, the slaughter was performed by hundreds of thousands of ordinary citizens, including judges, human rights activists, doctors, nurses, priests, teachers, friends, and even the spouses of the victims. The massive participation of the population in Rwanda in the Rwandan genocide is without documented historical precedent. Indeed, the very popularity of public participation is just what makes the genocide, the genocide committed against the Tutsi so unthinkable. We must never forget the important fact that during extermination stage in Rwanda, uh, an environment of extreme civil disorder existed in tandem with the upheaval of war. This allowed for all, manners, all manner of non genocidal crime to be committed for which the entire population of Hutu, Tutsi, Twa, and others was at risk. Civilian, militia, and military crimes included murder, rape, robbery, and arson to name but a few. And we owe it to humankind to keep alive the memory of the shared suffering of all those victims of this connected wartime immorality. At the end of the extermination phase of the genocide against the Tutsi, the death toll was estimated to be between 800,000 and 1,500,000 people. Running parallel to the liberation process was a massive exodus of refugees, the largest and fastest exodus in human history. Unlike refugees flow in all other worlds, the Rwandan exodus was not of a large number of individuals seeking safety, but a large-scale, centrally directed tactical retreat by the genocidal killers. This large, unprecedented convocation of mass murderer, intermingled with unwilling hostages, moved swiftly at a rate of a quarter of a million per day into the secure, nourishing arms of UNHCR, where it remains to this very day and are committing atrocities in the DRC Congo. This brings us to the final stage of genocide. The stage for us to sit up and pay attention. The stage for us to, stock, to take stock of events, to rethink our strategies, to focus on the welfare of our offsprings, and above all things, to reclaim our humanity. Denial is the final stage that always follows the human catastrophe. Denial, my fellow humans, is the most diplomatic stage of genocide. It is the calmest. It is the most academic. It is the most imaginative and the most eloquent. And yet, in the same breath, it is by far the deadliest. My fellow academics and friends, denial is indeed the surest indicators of potential for further genocidal massacres. All through history, the perpetrators of genocide dig up the mass graves, burn the bodies, try to cover up the evidence of and intimidate the witnesses. All through history, they readily deny that they, did, they committed any crimes and often blame what happened on the victims. They block investigations of the crimes and continue to govern until driven from power by force whereupon they flee into exile and continue to pontificate. There, they remain in exile 
and act with impunity unless they're captured and trialed. In this regard, the anatomy of denial in the genocide against the Tutsi, it is not different from other past genocides, and anything different would not have been the traditional human genocidal norm. What does make Rwanda unique was the massive participation of all levels of population in the atrocities. This fact alone seeds the entire population today with a countrywide mixture of perpetrators, witnesses, and survivors, all living in a close proximity to one another. It comes as no surprise, therefore, that to date, there are about 200 reported cases in which survivors and witnesses have been killed over the past 15 years. The ongoing killings of people as a direct consequence of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi is a matter of, gra of grave concern. What is disappointing, though, is the lack of media and scholastic attention that this receives. Denial is a phase that requires academic fortitude and judging by the high academic caliber of many of the perpetrators of genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, you can be rest assured that there is no shortage of it. There is no shortage in scope of learning and in depth of learning. And with academic skills comes eloquent genocidal linguistic terminology. And the two new terms come to the fore in the aftermath of the extermination phase, revisionism and negationism. Let us for a moment try to grasp the concepts that underlie these two words. Historical revisionism may be legitimate or illegitimate. That which is legitimate is, by definition, the legitimate peer-reviewed scholastic correction of an existing body of historical knowledge. And indeed, whenever a new indisputable body of evidence emerges, it is only right and fitting that appropriate corrections are made in the literature. On the other hand, the visionism that it is illegitimate and which concerns us yet today is the illegitimate distortion of denial of the historical record such that selected events appear more acceptable, usually in favor of the cr criminal perpetrators and their associates. In the mode and the manner of the historical revision constitute denial of a historical crime, then the term negationism is sometimes used. You will understand, therefore, why in the case of Rwanda, I may use one or the other term interchangeably and with ease. The visionism is a far cry from propaganda. Propaganda appeals to the emotions and to the masses, both of which are spent forces at this point in time. The visionism appeals to the intellect and to the intellectual thereof. It advances a point of view and its offsprings are readily absorbed and appreciated by those who are not fully aware of the state of affairs in Rwanda. Intellectuals from inside and outside Africa have a hard choice to make, to believe the verbal and written works of internationally based scholars and self-exiled Rwandan professionals, or the cacophony of apparently unintelligible voices from the, the center of Africa, and indeed, if Africa is perceived internationally to be a jungle continent, crawling with illiterate, manless savages, then the intellectuals would say, surely these refined works from scholars of such distinction must be true. The bulk of the presentation and publications that exist and continue to be generated are, the direct, are directed to portray the Tutsi as the primary aggressor and anti instigator of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, and the Hutu as a misjudged, distressed party. Others apportion equal blame to both sides of the Hutu-Tutsi conflict, and the favorite mooted theory is the one of double genocide. This theory, this theory argues that the Hutu had such an overwhelming numeral, numerical organization and military superiority such that in order for forces of the Tutsi-led Rwandan Patriotic Front to succeed, they would have needed to use exceptional force in both magnitude and brutality in order to break the resolve of the Hutu population. And in so doing, they effectively carried out a genocide of their own. The theory concludes it was not possible to achieve victory otherwise. That being the case, 
both sides are to blame for the genocide and should, and should share equal responsibility. Negationism, the vision is by denial. A genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda is the true outcome of a seasoned divisionists. It is structured and scientific and characterized by several categories and subcategories that we may extrapolate from the works of Deborah Lifchett, Michael Schimmer, and Alex Grobman. The first category, outright denial, rejects the very existence of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda and relegates it to the status of civil war. The second category, deflective negationism, admits the existence of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, but channels the guilt for its perpetration in several directions, thereby creating several subcategories. Argument based on the, t on the target into which guilt is deflected. This may include historical arguments according to which the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda was the price paid by the Tutsi for the past atrocities and subjugation of the Hutu. Conspira conspiratorial arguments according to which Uganda, Britain, and the USA conspired to diminish French influence in Africa and create an Anglophone Tutsi supremacy in Central Africa. Defensive arguments according to which the Tutsi by their aggressive actions forced the Hutu to resort to, leg to legitimate measures of self-defense. Reactive arguments, according to which the disloyalty manifested by the Tutsi toward the Rwandan government triggered a backlash against them. A vindictive arguments, according to which Hutu extremists suggest that the Tutsi as a collective planned, provoked, and orchest orchestrated the genocide against themselves. An environmental argument, according to which Poverty, overpopulation, and poor agriculture yields against the background of illiteracy. A multifactorial argument, any combination of the possible arguments. The third category, selective negationism, which is a mixture of outright, outright and deflective negationism, acknowledges that genocide occurred but it denies any participation of one or other group in, the, in its perpetration. It promoters typically rejects involvement of their own countries in the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Revisionists typically advance their views on the local, regional, and international stage by presenting forged documents as if they were genuine, by providing good reasons as to why genuine documents are not to be trusted by deliberately misinterpreting and mistranslating Kinyarwanda into other languages, especially in the refugee camps in the Congo. They attend, they attend talk shows and conferences. They publish widely. They use the same vehicles that brought, into the, hor that brought the horrors of genocide into our homes and into our lives. To add the confusion, <coughs> websites, movies, books, scholastic dissertation have been written by supposedly credible authors. Now, a growing number of in internet sites associated with Hutu extremist hate groups are popping up and disseminating aberrant information. Where in the past an individual was once limited to printing and distributing this information in a single small geographic location, <coughs> now that the same individual can broadcast thousands of messages of deceit across oceans and continents into homes, academic institutions, corridors of immense power with no more than a click of a computer mouse. Right now, there's so much disinformation in the public domain that even the most discerning scholar and astute politician is easily confused and take, taken for a ride. What makes both the exiled and the resident Rwandan division is so convincing and so dangerous is the fact that behind all the deception, they actually know the truth. The modus operandi, as Mark Twain puts it, is get your facts first, and then you can distort them as you please. As for all the other non Rwandan divisionists from all walks of life politicians, judges, academics, analysts, NGOs, and the list goes on they all have two things in common confidence and ignorance. There is, however, a special worrisome category of revisionists, the governmental revisionists. These governmental revisionists are national governments motivated by guilt. 
either the guilt of active participation directly or by proxy, or the guilt of non-intervention, or even the occasional abstraction for which excuses abound. Saving face and maintaining the moral high ground is the prime motivation force behind the revisionists' approach to genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. What is worrisome about the genocidal proactive government revisionists is the, the, it's the enormous international influence and the available resources at their disposal and the readiness and length to which they are prepared to go make the world believe them. Such is the fickle nature of men when saving face is more important than saving lives. One of the most glaring examples of proactive state supported revisionism culminated in the arrest in Germany of a senior female Rwandan diplomat on the 9th of November of last year. This arrest was on the basis of an international warrant arrest issued in 2006 by an aging independent French judge who has since retired. This warrant arrest also targeted several high-ranking Rwandan officials, including the current president of Rwanda. The world was asked to believe that this lady, a refined diplomat, had offered comfort, aid, and sustenance to a group of shady international terrorists of Rwandan Tutsi extraction, and that these terrorists, armed with large Soviet-made surface-to-air Sam-16 missile, missile had wedged into Kigali by a day and waited amid the military fortifications of the Kigali International Airport for the return of President Abdelimana. When all was quiet and all was dark, the terrorists peered into the night sky, singled out the presidential plane from amongst others and shot it down. Then, abracadabra, they vanished in a puff of smoke. The world was, be, was expected to believe, and still is, that genocide may never have taken place if this incident had not occurred. However, it's serves to say that we would need a lot more than just a good pair of eyes to decide who is in the dark night sky, and you need to be amongst the chosen few before you would ever know the detailed flight path of a president in an office. Adolf, Adolf Hitler once said, and I quote, I shall give a propaganda reason for starting the war, whether it is plausible or not. The victor will not be asked whether he told the truth. But then Hitler, with just like his Rwandan compadres, went on to lose the war. Today, the, mis the masterminders of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda and their associates may delay, but cannot escape their obligation to explain their actions to the whole of mankind. There is therefore no surprise that revisionists the world over take much comfort and delight in the fact that the French political decision to retract this arrest warrant is not forthcoming. They perch like virtues in the moral high ground and profess to the world citing that a political decision to resolve this issue would amount to political interference, compromise the independence of the French judiciary, and mask what may well be the truth. Rwanda is probably in the throes of Fashoda syndrome. The Fashoda syndrome has nothing to do with the well-being of Rwanda nation. It is the unofficial name given to a tendency within French foreign policy in Africa which gives imp importance to the assertion of French influence in the areas which may become susceptible to British influence. For all of you, if you know the history, if you draw a British line from Cape Town to Cairo and the French line from Dakar to Djibouti, where the two line intersect is a fashoda known now Kodak in the Nile of Sudan. During the scramble for Africa, it was believed that whosoever would control Fashoda would control Africa. In 1898, the French major Marchand locked up first the Fashoda with an exhausted Raktagami. A few months after, Field Marshal Horatio Herbert Kirchner of Our Imperial Majesty's Royal Navy showed up, and the rest was history. Today, the choice between a predominantly Anglophone as opposed to Francophone leadership in Rwanda is a bitter pill to swallow 
in the French cycles and a sweet pill in the British one. In Rwandan cycles, since Rwandans are not linguistically deprived, there is no need to swallow any pill at all. Rwanda is a Kinyarwanda phone country, and the sooner the whole of the developed world appreciates, if appreciates that, the better it will be to resolve of the resolve of this final stage of genocide. We must not forget our internationally friends, the nice, misguided, influential, <coughs> bunny-hugging, I love you type of revisionist. People with no inherent malice but those but whose influence and unfiltered utterances over the mass media serves as a canon folder for the hardcore revisionists. These include some leading movie makers, academics, leading politicians, and their spouses, low-ranking embassy officials, tourists, relief workers, and a variety of, the, and, and, and a variety of ex, expatriate workers, etc., etc. This, this group is big, very big. Sections within this group are fomented foremost in a prompting in promoting the notion that seems to suggest that genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda occurred because of a global warming. They cite a combination of widespread illiteracy, overwhelming poverty, poor agriculture yields, and overpopulation as a leading cause of genocide. Ladies and gentlemen, these particular groups need your help, and once tamed, they may actually be very useful. There are revisionists in Europe, Americas, Africa, whose duty bound is to do good, and yet whose words and practices have brought a smile on certain face himself. Revisionism, prompted by grief, is an unfortunate aftermath of any tragedy, and people will always think that life would have been what life would have been if the tragedy had not occurred. Grief is a strong human emotion that briefly clouds the mind and even the most rational thinker, and only passage of time is its remedy. It is true that extermination is almost over, but now, in this phase of denial, Rwanda is a country that still, face, still faces the risk of invasion from a predominantly Hutu Ram state in the Congo. This Ram state, housed within the security and the sanctity of UN refugee camps, consists of the former Rwandan government that presided over the genocide, the faithful, the faithful foreign backers, the former Rwandan National Army, and the militia along with an estimated mass population of two million, serving as both human shields and recruit reservoir. The presence of this state, coupled with the intransigence of governmental revisionists, is a constant reminder that the, that the fight is not over that the final stage of genocide is not over. Then there is, a, a matter, there is the matter of legislation. Truth needs no law to mandate its acceptance. And the truth of genocide in Rwanda is clear to anyone who chooses to critically examine the recorded events or to remember what they saw or to remember what they did. And in any case, in this age of information, we all in Rwanda, we were all in Rwanda to see for ourselves. Anti-revisionist laws are an entirely different matter. Anti-revisionists and anti-head speech laws exist in France, Belgium, Israel, Germany, Austria, and a few other countries. These laws prohibit the public revision or denial of Jewish history as it pertains to the Holocaust and seek to criminalize head speech some of you here may have heard of David John Caldwell Irving. In November of all five, Mr. Irving, the author of, a, of over 30 books, was arrested in Austria and charged with the, speech, with the speech crime of trivializing the Holocaust. He was denied bail and subsequently sentenced to three years of imprisonment. It matters not whether or not he had a genuine academic point of view. What matters? is that his views ran contrary to the views of those who suffered the most, contrary to the historical evidence and contrary to the written law. Such is the standard by which the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda must be measured. 
Therefore, local and international anti-revisionist legislation is both a matter of vital necessity and urgency. It is inspiring to know that legislation has been evaluated in Rwanda, in Rwanda to deal with the Rwandan revisionists and regressionists in the same manner. It is only right that the rest of the world follow and enact and enforce appropriate laws that deal with the matter of Rwandan revisionists within their borders. It is, after all, our understanding that the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda was indeed a crime against humanity and therefore must be treated as such. Of course, we would expect the revisionists to say that the Rwandan government would like to suppress the version of the truth by enacting laws but in enacting laws, we must recognize the philosophy of Plato and accept that laws are partly formed for the sake of good men in order to instruct them how they may live on friendly terms with one another and partly for the, sake of, for the sake of those who refuse to be instructed, whose spirit cannot be subdued or softened or hindered from plunging into evil. Within Rwanda itself, where then do we draw the line to distinguish between freedom of speech and the concern for national security? Just how harmful are the unchecked waging tongues of the local population in public and in private? How dangerous are the visionist sentiment of the school teachers, the market vendors, or the perpetual drunkards? There will always be a healthy debate between those who feel that the right to free speech should be restricted with respect to hate speech and those who feel that the civil liberty of free speech of the individual should be upheld above all things. What makes cultural diversity into, what, what makes cultural diversity change into cultural animosity? How provocative and dangerous is it for Rwandans to refer to themselves by their proud cultural roots as Hutu, Tutsi, and Kwa? Some of these things are difficult to quantify but we must recall that, this, that the progression of events that eventually leads to genocide starts within the exact problem. However, this only becomes a real problem when organization takes root. Post-genocide Rwanda has taken a bold step and ethnic classification has officially disappeared in all Rwandan, and all Rwandans are again where they ostensibly are once were, simply Rwandans. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I say this to you. The challenge to right the wrongs of the past and to, present, and to present, to discuss, to document, and to disseminate the history of Rwanda is the sole responsibility of the people of Rwanda, and it's precisely because of that challenge that we gathered here today. The visionist is armed with two powerful tools, his tongue and his pain. The spoken word is soon forgotten because what is not written is like water on a dark spark. The written word will not disappear. What the revisionist writes will not go away. Responding to each and every new imaginative concoction, concoction, concoction is death trap in itself. For every single reasonable response or countermeasure you, you try to make to a revisionist allegations, you will receive 10 new exciting fabrications. You will be pleased to know that we have three weapons in our armamentarium, our tongue, our pen, and the truth. The challenge is upon us all, especially on all Rwandans and their friends, to compile, document, and publish an accurate history of genocide. The same public platforms and avenues of mass communication available to the most tireless revisionists are also available to us. The onus is upon us to use them diligently and daily on the and the people of the world will listen and read. Soon we we'll join the voices, the voices of the revisionists with the truth. We should all support the hearings and readings from more from our Rwandan authors, historians, and philosophers. Distinguished guests, we commend the Rwandan government before, and the Rwandan people for their efforts. The efforts by them and others like them will eventually succeed in bringing the gen this genocidal phase of divisionism and negationism to, the, to its ultimate end. 
and will give Rwandans at home and in the diaspora encouragement, direction, and perseverance to rally behind the nation's mantra of never again. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for gathering here today, for coming and sharing the history, the struggle, and the aspirations of a nation once divided. And in a final summation of all that has been said, I now leave you with the words of Richard Cohen. The truth is the last victim of genocide. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kamikaze, for this uh, lecture. And I will now um, like to open this up for discussion and introduce our panel. Uh, we have with us uh, Commissioner Galen Kirkland, who was appointed by uh, Governor David Patterson to serve as Commissioner of the New York State Division of Human Rights in May 2008. As the Commissioner, Mr. Kirkland is responsible for developing, managing, and executing strategies to prosecute systematic forms of discrimination and for developing policies and legislation to advance the civil rights of all New Yorkers. Prior to joining the division, Mr. Kirkland served as Director of Program Development at the New York State Office of the Attorney General, where he also served as First Deputy Director of Policy Development during his eight-year tenure at that agency. Among the many organizations within which Mr. Kirkland has had leadership roles, are the New York City Civil Rights Coalition, West Harlem Community Organization, Association for Neighborhood Housing Developers, and Advocates for Children of New York. Mr. Kirkland holds a law degree from the University of Pennsylvania Law School and a Bachelor's of Arts from Dartmouth College. Next, we have Dr. Emily Tai, uh, who teaches history of Western civilization, women in world history, and the history of religion at Queensborough Community College. She has published both in the area of women's history and the history of medieval and early modern piracy, her specialty, and <clears throat> as well an area of research that takes her into, a con into consideration of the history of international law, the resolution of disputes over property and violence, and the development of the territorial state. Dr. Tai holds a PhD from Harvard University in history. And finally, we have Dr. Saria Danielson, who teaches history at uh, Queensborough Community College, teaches courses on uh, the history of genocide and the, and the history of the Holocaust, and is currently writing a book on the intellectual history of genocide, on the, of the genocide concept entitled The End of Genocide, The Uses and Abuses of Genocide, dated 1944 to 2004. Dr. Danielson holds a PhD in history from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And I will now like to open this um, for discussion among our panel and uh, to get questions from you, the audience. So the floor is all yours. And there is a microphone uh, that you need to turn on. <laughs> I can show you how to do that. Thank you, Tara. Yes. I, I would like to say a couple of um, words myself. I want to uh, first uh, thank Dr. Karakazi for her uh, very uh, chilling moving account of the uh, genocide in Rwanda. I also want to thank the Cumberbund Holocaust Center for making this conversation possible. Um, and what we just heard obviously raises a whole host of issues. In my own mind, I look at it from two standpoints. Uh, one having to do with an understanding that genocide is really, that can be defined as the unlimited or limitless violence against a group in our society or any society. Um, it can take many different forms, but it's part of a continuum that I think begins with disrespect for human rights, disrespect or denial of the humanity of other people. And the Division of Human Rights works every day to combat this disrespect in adjudicating individual complaints of discrimination in bringing its own uh, litigation against those entities in our society that are violating human rights, as well as in responding to hate crimes across this state of New York, uh, not only to denounce what's happened, but to help communities to 
to take action to make sure there is no repetition. We also combat this disrespect with a school-based program and a teach the teacher program, which is intended to help um, faculty and schools, public schools across the city, uh, to respond to incidents of bias, bias in school settings. Um, I think that it's important for us to all accept the truth that genocide can happen in any place, in any country, under the right conditions. Um, I think many of us uh, walk around thinking that what happened in Rwanda and, and so many other, other places that are depicted around this room couldn't happen here. And I think what that truth as to the capacity of all humans to descend to this level means is that we have a responsibility, uh, a responsibility to defend human rights, to prevent the dehumanization and objectification of people in our society in order for us not to reach the point where um, the hatred and bigotry and violence has accelerated to such a point that you either have to have a civil war or you have the breakdown of society that we've just heard accounted. Um, secondly, before I uh, close my preliminary remarks here, I just want to also say that I feel very strongly that what happened in Rwanda, I think, demonstrates very clearly that we need uh, an international body which is much more powerful than the United Nations to be able to intervene when incidents, when developments, when this, when this type of mass um, insanity strikes uh, a society or a region. Um, I, I'm not the only person who said this. There are many people around who believe that we need a world federation that has the capacity uh, to address not only issues of genocide, but also environmental issues and issues having to do with famine and other really critical human needs. And, and, and so uh, this is something that I think has been clearly demonstrated by the repeated failure of our um, world to prevent these types of incidents. So I'm really looking forward to uh, the uh, balance of the discussion this afternoon. Earlier we were talking about some very interesting issues having to do with um, the definition of genocide. I'd be interested to engage in that as well. So, um, any other panelists want to wait at this point? <clears throat> Yeah, um, I also have to say that I think it was an excellent um, summary going over what happened in uh, Central Africa 15 years ago. Um, and um, I just wanted, and there are many things we can expand on and, and discuss more that I would like also to bring into a context of um, genocides as they've taken place at least for the last 150 years, or probably uh, closer to 200 years. But one thing I wanted to emphasize, actually underline what you were saying, which I think, just to kind of bring them together, because I think this is so vital. Um, something I also, we spend a lot of time on in course, in my courses on the history of genocide, is exactly the emotionless act that this violence very often is. Um, the, you pointed out, for example, that the justifications for the violence was often one that was self-defense. And I can tell you there is not a single genocide that has taken place that has not been articulated in a very sort of scientific way, intellectual way, um, and often, and, and oh, actually in every single case that I can think of, the argument of the perpetrator has always been, I am doing this in self-defense. Consequently, the denial then of the genocide itself becomes a logical conclusion of that justification. Because the argument is this wasn't really what you claim it, it was. Uh, it was self-defense. And, and, and this is something where I think I would love to see um, this knowledge of what genocide truly is translating to the political side of what, what causes and generates this kind of violence. Because we often assume that it is, we use the word prejudice, we use the word hate, we use emotional words, which for the most part that dies out very quickly. It's often the, the, the entities that commit genocide are often very uh, hesitant to use that kind of emotion because it isn't sustained for very long and it cannot produce the kind of effect that we, that we see. It has to be articulated on a deeper level. As long as we understand genocide as a hate-based and a prejudice-based act, we will, we will then 
attack it on a level where it actually doesn't match where it is happening. Um, it, it is happening on, in, in, a, in an extremely, this, this is what makes it so frightening, is that it often is academically based. And so to your point about truth and accuracy, well, this is, this is I, I, I absolutely love and I find it very, very important that people are actively involved internationally, domestically, whatever it is, in current actions dealing with current issues. But as a scholar myself, an academic and historian, my job is precisely to try to decipher truth, try to find what actually happened in each of these cases, sort of uh, strip it of all of the attachments, all of the issues, all the political called reasons for why we, we think one thing or another. And one thing that emerges very clearly is this fact that we're dealing with something that is less emotional than we might want to, to, want to perceive it. One of the issues with that is because we can point to somebody as hating and prejudicial, then we can move it away from ourselves. Whereas if something is rationally argued, uh, it, is, it follows within a, a certain logic uh, never mind if the logic is based on, on factual errors, but it is nevertheless logical. Uh, it's something that can be understood and articulated, then it is much easier to participate in genocide, and it's much easier to deny genocide. And it makes us all a participant, as a matter of fact, much easier accessible for us. Uh, when we can place emotion just as if it, it's something that rises up with some hatred, where we rub our hands and, oh, I'd like to kill somebody, that is something that is not fundamentally part of the genocidal process. I uh, just wanted to underline that. I also want to talk a little bit about this issue of identity, but let me move on. Let Emily Tai say something. I guess a couple of things. Um, when we first sort of started talking about developing this panel, we talked about uh, the possibility of commenting on various aspects of what had happened in Rwanda. And I was asked to comment on uh, the interaction of uh, the experience of genocide and women. Uh, because of the teaching that I do on the history of women. Um, and I guess a couple of things are leaping out at me as uh, addressing some of the issues that Dr. Kamikaze, Dr. Danis, and, and Mr. Kirkman mentioned, which is, um, first of all, the idea that the genocide in Rwanda is one of the, is the first genocide in which uh, women are protected insofar as rape is announced as a crime of genocide because over 90% of the survivors of the genocide in Rwanda were raped. And about uh, 5,000 children were born of those rapes, uh, which are now citizens of Rwanda and have to take part in, in the work of rebuilding their country. At the same time, uh, Rwanda was a terrible reminder that uh, gender has nothing to do with the crime of genocide. And I think this speaks to the issue that Sarah just raised about rationalism. Uh, because women are also prosecuted for the crime of genocide, and specifically for inciting rape uh, in, in the genocide. But what strikes me as, as an issue in thinking about how women were prosecuted is that some of the women who were prosecuted for the crime of genocide were Belgian nun were nuns who were originally Benedictine nuns and then were, were, excuse me, were tried for their crimes in Belgium. And this was uh, both an affirmation of the world order that you just referred to, but at the same time an abrogation of Rwandan sovereignty, which I think comes back to the point that you raised. And I think it puts at the center of the problem uh, the way in which the, the rhetoric of genocide needs to be integrated with the action item of rebuilding a country after the trauma of genocide. Um, one of the things that I think has been very uh, interesting about the aftermath of this tragedy is the way in which the Rwandans kind of took back the process of rebuilding their country through the Wachaka, which were um, uh, their regional courts. It's basically a word that comes from uh, the Rwandan language that, that refers to a, a grassy exterior where, in, uh, where local villages would work out some of their disputes. And the Wachaka have been used as sort of forums for Rwandans to accuse neighbors of involvement in the genocide. In some cases, these accusations have led to uh, criminal convictions. In other cases, they've led to a kind of a, not ironing out, but a, a way for people who have survived the genocide, witnessed the genocide, and in some cases, perpetrated the genocide, uh, to try and live together. Um, as a medievalist, now I was trained in medieval history, one of the things that always leaps out at me when I think about the history of law 
is that justice, when it was first sort of articulated in Roman law, didn't mean uh, sort of an ideal of justice, it meant redress. And I think that when most people who survive a genocide think about genocide, they think about redress. You know, they're looking for the closure that justice can confer. And yet, at the same time, I think that uh, the, Dr. Kamikaze's remarks and, and everyone sitting here speaks to the fact that closure never really occurs. Genocide is a trauma inflicted on all of humanity, on all of memory, on the survivors who live through it, but also on everybody else who has to live with the fact that they stood by and let it happen. And I think that working that process out is the challenge that lies through a common society. And I wonder if there is some way of envisioning some kind of, of a world order that, that doesn't necessarily uh, get as grounded in territorial states as the UN currently does to get bogged down in the kinds of territorial state interests that interfered with adequate intervention in Rwanda, and at the same time could speak to these larger questions of rebuilding, you know, always affirming the memory of genocide as some kind of way of erecting a bulwark against the um, So, yeah, I'd love to revisit the issue of uh, whether or not genocide and the massive violation of human rights and denial of humanity is a rationalized system or an emotional system because um, I really base my conclusion on my exposure to other human beings during my per period on this planet and um, what I understand about people. We just heard an account of thousands upon thousands of people in the civilian population picking up machetes and other objects to hack other people to death. That is not a cold, rational process. Um, what I perceive is a, you may have a cold, rational process of dehumanization in the media or in the plotting of political figures, but the fact of the matter is that there has to be a constituency for what takes place. In order for that constituency to exist, and this is based on extrapolating from what I know about people, you've got to have um, an attitude that says that these other folks are not human beings. And in order to reach that point, you have to have an emotional basis that rejects their humanity. And that, in my mind, has to be based on some type of hatred. Uh, when you start talking about people as cockroaches, when you start talking about people as outside of the uh, uh, family of humanity, um, something has happened something strong and, uh, and gut-wrenching in your mind that has somehow pushed these people away. And so I have to uh, say this because it um, very directly relates to my belief that we all have a responsibility to work toward uh, preventing uh, the types of dynamics, the types of behavior, the types of uh, publicity, the types of policies that dehumanize other people because of the fact that it is a continuum. It is a continuum. And it doesn't just spring from, I'm telling you something, if somebody sat down uh, on Madison Avenue or anywhere else or in Hollywood and decided one day, okay, let me just uh, randomly choose a group and uh, decide to put together a program to eliminate them, they're going to have to, in the course of that marketing campaign, stoke up some emotional affect that will make it possible to go after those people. And so uh, if we don't understand that, that means that we're going to be blind to our obligations. And I think that's a very central issue. I, I respect uh, the scholarship uh, that has gone into an analysis of this issue, but for me, this is a central point. I guess I should respond quickly then. I think this is a fundamental disagreement. Uh, they cannot be bridged this simply and unfortunately um, you know this is where the scholarship clearly disagree with you uh, on this. Basically justification has been done in every single genocide on a very cold hard uh, way um, and we can go through that scholarship if you wish me to do so but and I think there is a level of of course there is emotion sometimes involved it's just that it cannot be sustained so and, but again this is the difference you know, in terms of the basis of what we do, where we do our work. And I understand your uh, concern in, in um, 
you know, stopping immediate acts of violence and so on. Um, let's just agree to disagree. Uh, unfortunately, there's so much scholarship that, that simply deny. Let me just give you a quick example because I think this is important. Dr. Daniels, not to cut you off, but I know some of the people in the audience had some questions and I want to give everyone no, a chance yeah. to. Mm -hmm. All right, let's do that. Because, but anyway, that's it. Because I would love to talk about it and I, and I think that um, these issues as they come up, I mean, we, we have uh, experts sitting on our panel and I think it's exciting to, to hear the opinions that I, and I hope that you two can interact as well um, more afterwards, but maybe we can open it up Uh, I'd like to ask a question that sort of goes to this bridging of the differences between scholarship and uh, uh, reality or current reality. Um, there was a New York Times article my father showed me that criticized this Holocaust Center. Uh, it, it was basically lauding its formation and everything, but there was an underlying criticism that the center was trying to universalize uh, the Holocaust experience, uh, and that some experiences need to be addressed uh, sort of uniquely as themselves first, if, if I understood it correctly. It seems like what we're talking about today says no, that in every genocide uh, there's a pattern that's followed. And uh, if we agree that this pattern or some pattern like it happens that leads ultimately to full genocide, then um, we ought to be able to recognize it in the earlier stages, one, two, three. Now, therefore, what concretely, and this is what I'm talking about with bridging the scholarship with the action, what concretely should be done to stop the progression of genocide as we move down that list? When we see, for example, uh, the Swiss uh, just had a uh, uh, a, a, a vote which uh, outlawed the uh, additional bu additional building of minarets. Is that one of those early stages that we ought to be putting up a red flag? Is that what something, and if so, concretely, what would each of you say we should do? The other point quickly is you said that it has to come from within the country in which it's happened. So do the rest of us just sit by until stage four or five or six? or are we obligated outside to say, we need to help, or are we just uh, getting involved in something we shouldn't be involved in? Um, before I let our, before I let, um, our panelists respond, I, I did just want to respond to the question of the uniqueness um, of each event. I think these are, and correct me if you disagree, Dr. Kamikaze, uh, these stages don't necessarily um, um, analyze or, or make every single genocide the same. I think each genocide is unique in and of itself, right? Mm -hmm. And so... I that, but they are done differently. Right, right. So I think that's an important point, and I think you have some things that you wanted to respond to. Um, this, you know, this sure, I would quickly... Uh, <laughs> I would quickly say that... So, okay. That um, when I say that one of them need to address this is today it's upon us women to start these processes by which by we go and speak out and speak truthfully but of course the outside world can as i said i mentioned the women it's our responsibility but our friends can also help us can you speak a little bit more about given your role in the u.n Yes. Um, a little bit more about what's happening there internally as far as things being evolving, things evolving. I mean, I'm, I'm talking not just about the criminal court, which is slow and, and yes, often for instance, excessive, but... Yes. yes, for instance, the United Nations, which is the work that I do, is that we lead negotiations. Some of the um, facts or the, one of the issues that Rwanda has been uh, very much involved in or uh, negotiating it is the recognition of genocide denial and addressing the issue and also bringing this genocide denial as the world in the international instruments, which of course people don't want to see. So it becomes a Rwandan campaign or fight and our friends help us. 
how do they help us? Like the, the United Nations in our way, they support the work, like the way we work is that we bring an issue uh, in the front, we justify why we're bringing it, and then we vote upon it. So other people who believe in it, who understood the purpose of it, will vote in favor. And of course there are those who don't want to vote in favor. Like Turkey would not want to see genocide denial in anywhere mentioned because it brings in the mention of the Armenian genocide. So in that case, the one that they would say the denial of genocide committed against the Tutsi, but that then focuses on the Tutsi genocide and that's not address all genocide. Um, just speaking to the question of um, um, preventing genocide, which I think is probably the, the, where um, most of the work should be directed if, if one really wants to deal with this issue. It starts with accurate information. It starts with understanding the, the, the correct origin of, of genocide, why it happened and how it happens. Uh, if you look on this wall here, it's a very selective group of genocides. Some of them wouldn't often fall, perhaps, under that category. Some of them have been clearly cited up. If you look at the case of Rwanda, um, and this speaks to one of the major problems, is that it has to, in order to solve it, you have to have a regional approach, one that goes beyond the national boundaries. Look at Darfur. I had a lecture uh, last year on campus dealing with the history of the background for Darfur. The problem is, and this, there's a lot of activism. You hear the word Darfur in the news. It sounds so good, a lot of money is raised. One reason why it's ineffective is because of the, um, the, the because of not understanding the regional context, not understanding how it began, and, and so on. And so there can be a lot of great work that is completely wasted because of a lack of information. And just to get back to our issue, because I really want to underline this, I understand um, this, this issue of I think the problem of understanding why genocides are able to be so successful has partly to do with how they are justified. And I know it might be comforting to think that it, it evolves into an emotion, but historical research simply does not bear it out. Uh, there, there will be elements of emotion from time to time, but in terms of a sustained attack on a population, it has to be justified on a rational basis that's simply been proven over and over again. And I think this is part of the problem. I see it. If we are going to prevent genocide, we have to understand the, the true causes of it and what leads to it. Not to mention that we also shouldn't attack problems that are similar to genocide, that may not erupt into genocide, but, but have similar similarities to it. And that, I think, is part of what you are discussing here. So this is my five cents. Okay. Um, uh, I think one of the reasons why it's possible to um, sell the rationale for genocide is because the awareness, the ability of people to um, appreciate the humanity of other people has been degraded to such a point. But to answer your question about um, what can be done concretely, I think we all have the, um, as human beings, uh, capacity to evolve to the level where we do uh, find um, love and kindness and caring for other people to be higher than hate and violence and other things like that. And I think the real answer is to educate people. What happens in here is what controls whether or not we have a genocide, whether or not we have uh, societies that respect human rights. If everybody had the ability to respect other people who embraced, if everybody embraced that point of view, uh, we wouldn't have these problems. And so if you want to be effective, I think it's education. I spent um, at least 12 years of my own life uh, working in civil rights education in, in Brooklyn with Benson Hurst after Yusuf Hawkins was murdered uh, in 1989. Norman Seal and I taught a course in civil rights and race relations. We did it because of, we really believe that the way to make change is to educate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As to the lower Today, there is an organization called the Skinheads, which is international and is going on around the world and growing and growing and growing, and yet nothing is being done to stop them. And I know I can't say, how can you stop them? I certainly am not capable of doing it myself, but there must be people who can stop this organization from growing. 
I don't want to answer her because uh, we, we, yeah, no, I just wanted to say that uh, power corrupts and what's happened is that we have the papers in this country and around the world who are constantly getting to the people who are poor, who don't have, and that's the way they get their armies to do the things that they do. They feel that if they get enough people out there to do the harm that is they don't want to do it, though they have someone else do it. The Goebbels have propagandized everything that goes on, and what happens is they have the people that keep on following them, and we have genocide. This is the way they do it with all the propaganda that goes on, and it will never stop because it happens here in the United States. We have people on the, on the television and radio who talk hatred constantly, and there is no way of stopping it because we are a people who believe in you are allowed to say what you want to say whenever you want to say it. Thank you for those comments. And as I walk and, and hand a microphone um, to our panelists, I, I did want to follow up and kind of broaden that uh, 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 question of media and the role of media in both if we think about the, the um, hate radio that was so, so popular in Rwanda. Um, and and was key in in, uh, in uh, the provoking and, and the propaganda campaigning that had been taking place. So what what do you think? This is to any of you. The role of media should be where can media become more active, more proactive in responding, especially in this age of globalization, especially in having such such technology which is used in in. Unfortunately, so many negative ways. How can we change that? How can we transform that? Well, I think that uh, one obvious um, requirement we have is for the messages that are sent out to include a much broader band of, of those messages that are um, humane and um, rational and sane as they relate to what serves the interests of humankind. Um, uh, we have some conflicts in the media because often it is very lucrative to uh, misinform and misguide people. And so you see it in music, you see it in music videos, you know, all sorts of images, misogyny, and all the rest. Um, uh, but uh, we are in a position now with the um, development of the technology in terms of the internet and all the new uh, forms of communication, uh, you, people have their cell phones, they can get um, uh, download information that way, um, there are free websites, there's all sorts of stuff going on where we can get more positive messages out there, it doesn't all have to be celebrity, it doesn't all have to be um, uh, the distorted and somewhat polluted uh, stuff that, that ends up uh, making it impossible for us to make uh, progress. And the, other, and, and the other thing I want to touch on is how you counteract the hate uh, media, but the hate uh, radio people is to have people go on who have the right message, in my opinion, <laughs> which has more to do with love and hate. And uh, that's one of the things that we've done at the division is to contact people in the religious community and in, in various places to ask them to come together and raise their voices to defend the human rights of those who are under assault. And it, it's an ongoing um, effort that we have to make. It, it's not something that can lapse. It's not something we can take for granted. And that's why I'm so adamant about the business of trying to influence people on an emotional level and as an intellectual level. I appreciate the fact that you know uh, plans can be implemented and so forth, but you have to have people willing to accept those plans if you want to make that possible. Did you have to answer my question? What was your, what was your question? Yeah, mine was, the skin mine was about the skin, the skin and well, what could be done about something well, like that, you know, that, which is international. I, I know it's international, and, and as a matter of fact, um, uh, we have uh, not just skinheads here, but we have uh, a group called the National Alliance, which used to be out west, uh, that had to move its headquarters uh, from, I believe it was uh, Utah uh, or some state like that, because they were successfully prosecuted for causing the death of a journalist and all of their income was attached and they moved to Allentown, Pennsylvania. And, um, it, and I was told that at a conference in, that was held on Hate Crimes Nationally. So we have those groups, we have a lot of different groups in the United States that are threats, uh, who, are, who are violent, who go out in the woods with, with you know, uh, guns and everything and, and practice 
for their own little programs. And what we have to do is educate people again. We have to make sure that the laws are enforced so that they aren't able to do things that are illegal. We've got to be careful about uh, uh, viol destroying the First Amendment, on the other hand, because that can flip over to make it impossible for us to be able to defend our rights because all of a sudden you're telling, you know, you create a system where somebody can say what you can say. And suppose somebody, the wrong person, starts to say what you can say. So, so that's a problem. But uh, it's, 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 it's a constant struggle of advocacy. It's a matter of mobilization of good people. This is what we do at the Division of Human Rights. We, we try and create a rallying point for those who care. And we, be, and, we, and we make sure that people understand that there's a responsibility in that regard. Um, actually, coming to the experience, I would say that in most countries, um, some European countries, it's against the law to have the, the, the hate speech. So if these people promote uh, violence against a certain kind of people, they'll be persecuted. In Rwanda, it's against the law. And and when I, I, I come back to the freedom of uh, speech, which is um, allowed in this country, in many countries it's limited because, like in Rwanda, we have seen the negative side of it. And uh, we have lived it. And um, the radios, the media as well, we try to promote a positive kind of media. And when it comes to, if the media, goes into areas where it can escalate into violence, then it's prohibited in the Constitution. There's certain things that the media cannot do. And um, coming back to what the, the Commissioner said, is that uh, bringing people who speak about positive things on the radio. But most of the time, sometimes it's the owners of the radio that actually promote the negative things. So what does the government do? And also holding our government account accountable, because the government might decide not to do anything because they are overwhelmed with other issues. So it's upon us individuals to, if I as an individual and you as an individual we decide to do something, collectively we can do something and bring our governments to do what they are to be, to, to be doing. So you have to understand as an individual that you have power and you, if you see something that is disturbing, you have to act. Sometimes we go about doing our own businesses, our daily struggles, that we say, ah, this is bad, and then we forget about it. But we shouldn't, because it's these small, small things that later on escalate in major problems. Um, I wanted to come back to all of the comments that were raised, because one of the things that I think it comes to the heart is the question of um, what, what Mr. Kirkland was talking about, this idea of free speech which is so central to um, American principles. And yet at the same time, speech can be an early form of threat. And I think actually the New York Times article was also sort of dealing with this problem. Of at what point does thinking something hostile that sort of represents a kind of letting off of steam in a, plural, in a pluralized society, um, you know, sort of skate over into something that is potentially um, disruptive to civil society. And, and I think that that, that's something that goes to the heart of, uh, to some extent, the heart of decentralized versus centralized media. Um, one of the big problems in Rwanda, as I understand it, is that ultimately you were talking about a government program of hate that was being promoted through the media, widely disseminated um, by an audience of listeners who were then not uh, not applying what, what we as instructors like to call critical thinking skills. Um, and. And I think that all of those pieces go into it. Um, you know, I'm here as an educator, as is Dr. Danielson, and, and our job, to some extent, is to educate um, our students and to get them thinking critically about the long-term effects of anything they do or say, um, to understand that, that everything that we do has ripples in a civil society. Um, and at the same time, there may be a certain value to not criminalizing certain kinds of speech even when they are deeply, deeply offensive, because the speech itself becomes an action that, pre that preempts other kinds of actions. The difficulty, I think, is when it skates over into what this gentleman mentioned, this idea of outlawing, for example, minarets. At that point, I think we have to think very hard about how committed all of us are to living in a plural society, because a plural society is perforce. We're not all the same. 
and even in the context of territorial states that often idealize homogeneity um, as some kind of a way of, of bringing people together, the reality is that that pluralism exists. I think that's the fundamental issue that we have to tangle with as members of the human community, and then we have to figure out how it can walk and talk and roll. And actually interesting, um, this is actually an interesting debate between an American uh, political philosophy and a European political philosophy, American political philosophy that holds sacred the right to free speech. And I think what needs perhaps to be underlined is that the right to free speech is part of an overall set of individual rights, one that does not think in group terms, but one that thinks in individual terms. And I think that's really what, what the debate perhaps should be about, that um, I understand definitely your concerns. Uh, and, and in Europe, one doesn't see this is limiting free speech as such a problem. But in the US, because really one of the ways to protect groups is by protecting the individuals as themselves completely autonomous, an individual that needs to have rights themselves. And if you protect that individual, then, you, then in fact you are protecting groups. And, and, and so um, that's really how I think the, the American political circumstance is set up and one I, I, I strongly support. Thank you. I think we have a couple of questions in the audience. And uh, we have to finish in about five minutes. So we'll make it quick. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not quite as erudite as our distinguished panel, but I'm really hearing two things. From over here, I heard the concept of biased crimes, uh, be it the international skinheads, the American Nazi Party, the National Renaissance Party, these hate groups who basically are a one-on-one. -on -one. To me, that's not genocide. Just the very definition of genocide, the killing of a group, of a genus. And in my mind, it really comes down to one thing. And you mentioned it before, and it's politics. These are by design. These people, skinheads, etc., they are the fodder who are used by the politicians who are using the genocide for whatever their political gain is. And that, in my mind, is really the very basis, and it's much harder and more difficult to deal with that. Education, in my mind, does not deal with that. Teaching people to play nice with one another does not deal with that. And the one that really caught my eye was right here, was Cambodia. What was the basis of the genocide? It wasn't race, it wasn't religion, it wasn't ethnics. It, 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 it was educated class who may taint the political beliefs of whoever was there at the time, the Khmer Rouge or Paul Pot or whoever it is. And it needs to be attacked on that level as opposed to dealing with hate crimes and bias, which is dealt with, in my mind, on a different level. How do we deal with the politics behind genocide and, and not the results of genocide. I knew it wasn't here, you died for something. I just want to say quickly, um, I don't think it's an either or. I think we have many battlefronts here. We had a battlefront in terms of the systemic and the political and all of the machinations that you refer to in terms of people being manipulated. We have um, a battlefront on the individual level, the community level. The point of the fact, though, is that these are all people acting. And uh, it's very interesting. When I, when I went to a conference that had a, a focus on the hate groups, uh, a person who had been in the Nat National Alliance was a speaker. He left because they told him that they wanted to kill his son because he had a cleft palate. He had a he was dis dis deformed, you know, sort of like a Nazi thing. He said, I can't do that, that's my son. And then he sort of snapped out of it. But the point is that he was talking about people being involved, being marginalized, people feeling powerless, people feeling as if they had to, you know, compensate for some de deficit. Uh, these are people who are homegrown. Uh, we're not talking about some big, uh, you know, conspiracy at some radio station or in Hollywood saying, you know, let's pull these people, these crazies together. So the sprouting up, we have to fight against them. There are a lot of different battlefronts. They're on a lot of different levels. I 100% I agree with that. Of course, there are different levels, but we are talking about two different things. And, and sometimes 
being an academic, as you say, things more complicated. Thank you for making it so clear. Uh, you're absolutely right. It is it because it is based on that kind of a, a strongly argued political basis that's the problem. And just mentioning the issue of Cambodia, uh, how how do you? And this is what I think a lot of people misconstrue is that they think we have to have some form of of natural ethnic boundary of a group that we can attack. That ethnic boundary, that identification can be created out of anything. Uh, and, and, it has, and as it is and then created and bonded together, you can make justification. We have Cambodia as a case where educated elite as well as political ideology uh, was one basis. You look at, and, uh, in the case of the Ukraine, which is also up here somewhere, um, uh, we might call it a racialization or a biologization of identity where people are of a certain social class now placed within a category that believed to be dangerous. And then you look in the case of, of Rwanda. Now, we're talking about people that have been given a biological identity but historically extremely intermingled. Uh, and, and it has to be created. The identity has to be created. And that takes rational process. I'm so sorry to understand. <laughs> And that, and, and so as that is going on, as that creation is going on, um, yeah, it's it. And how do you attack that? Well, you have to start at the at the beginning. <laughs> no, actually, I just wanted to say somehow what she just highlighted that it's created, and uh, we have to look at this from the beginning. We have to see she what she very nicely said. <laughs> and we have, we, I, I think we'll end. Um, I, I think we'll end. We're going to end. Yeah. yeah. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. So we need. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the teacher. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. um, I think we need to take a more multidisciplinary perspective, and I think that would overcome some of the disagreements that I noticed in the panel and in uh, on the floor. For instance, the difference between the underlying um, ideology that you're speaking about and the emotions. Well, if we took a more multidisciplinary approach, the attitudes, in, I'm a social psychologist, we don't make that differentiation. Attitudes have both an emotional basis and a cognitive basis, and you need them both then they're combined and we don't separate them to understand really what's going on in genocide. You can see that perfectly, definitely, in what went on in Rwanda, and you can see that in the Holocaust, too. There is an ideology and there's a strong emotion that comes in, that fits into it and, 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 and runs into this motorway. Okay. Just, okay. No, thank you. Thank you for that comment. And I think also, before we end, um, and I'd just like to give our panelists one last chance to make final comments, um, and also just to comment on the identity and identity formation. I mean, I, my thinking is that identities exist. They're just there. It's just a matter of how they become formalized and politicized and so on and so forth. So what processes are in place or become, become active um, as, as that origin. I think that, that, is, that is the interesting thing and, and you know, one aspect of how we, begin, we can begin to analyze um, um, the, the inception of different different genocides. So um, unfortunately, we have to end. I did just want to give uh, people a chance um, for for last comments, questions, things. Um, the only thing that I would throw into this is uh, the point that was made about politics and and this intersection of politics and social psychology. I think is key here. Um, because politics plays a role not just in the way that genocide happens, but also in the way that the international community responds. Yes. Um, and, and so that the work of recovering from a genocide is never over. Um, it is a process, I think, of forging an international dialogue about how to resolve these issues in, in ways that address some of the underlying tensions that lead to genocide that can sometimes be uh, political, can be questions about divisions of resources. All of those things get harnessed when this kind of rhetoric starts to fly around in a dangerous way. And so I think that that is really a sort of an action item for everyone. Please. Thank you. 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 Th
Well, I just want to uh, conclude by saying I'm a very hopeful person about uh, our ability to overcome these problems because I believe in the evolution of consciousness and I believe in that because I've spent a lot of time uh, going to different neighborhoods in the st city of New York, talking to different racial and ethnic groups to form multiracial coalitions to fight against bias. Uh, and also because I think that we're really talking about social norms that we can participate in establishing. Um, it's interesting as we look at the, the origin of, of identity formation, all of our identity, we all have identity, but the true nature of our identity is that it's organic. In other words, it's something we, we think we're born into something, we're really not, you know, we think we have the same culture as our parents, but we really change that culture in our lifetime. It goes from week to week, month to month, year to year. Um, what we associate with culture is something that's extremely organic, that is, that it's, it's constantly changing. We, we are constantly choosing different identities. That's the true nature of identity. The problem is, is when identity becomes biologized, and when it is fixed to something that's, that's constant, that's in your blood, that can't be changed. And, and it's at that stage where we have a danger. And that's something that I wanted to throw out there. Um, to keep identity organic versus the biologized version of it, I think, is the ultimate battleground here. And that's something where we actually put on, on a broader political level, I think this is where the battle is. Uh, and where the issue of hate and so on comes in so strongly. As it's that move from an identity that is individual and changing the one that is believed to be fixed and permanent. Okay. No has it back to me. So I would like to thank our panel, um, our speaker, and all of you for being here. Uh, we do have to end. If our panelists want to stick around afterwards, for if people want to come up to questions, that's up to them. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.